Welcome to the Illinois Soybean Association's Illsoy Advisor Webinar. <clears throat> I am Jennifer Jones, Research Specialist at the Illinois Soybean Association. Today, Dr. Andrew Marganot will be presenting what are climate smart agricultural commodities and how do soybeans fit in. This webinar is being recorded. The recording as well as more information on ISA funded research projects can be found at illsoyadvisor.com and that's ilsoyadvisor.com. Questions can be submitted through the webinar Q&A anytime during the presentation. Uh, we will address those at the end um, if they are not addressed during the presentation itself. Also, one CEU in crop management is available for certified crop advisors. A QR code will be provided at the end of the presentation that you can scan with your smart device. But if you prefer, you can email your name and CCA number. <clears throat> that is also an option and you can send that to Connie Copley and that's connie.copley at illsoy.org, and we will drop that email in the chat as well. All right, so today I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Marganot. Dr. Marganot is a soil scientist and associate professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He joined the Illinois agricultural scene in 2017, where he leads a research team that evaluates nutrient biogeochemistry in our state and the greater north central U.S. region. Dr. Marganot's research focuses on phosphorus management, soil health, and carbon crediting with the goal of supporting efficient use of nutrients for crop productivity that support environmental quality. All right, Andrew, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and to let you introduce today's topic and your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, thanks again to ISA for hosting this webinar and for their funding support for the research that you're about to hear about. My name's Andrew Marganot. Uh, as has been said, I'm a soil scientist by training at the U of I, been here for about seven years. And a lot of what my lab does is we try to understand how soils function to support cropping systems being productive and more sustainable. The topic of today's webinar gets at a ISA funded checkoff project. Um, the project overall seeks to understand these integrated outcomes of cropping systems centered around productivity, because that is number one, as well as soil health, water quality, and the topic of today, climate impacts, specifically uh, climate equivalency or CO2 equivalency that causes climate forcing. There is increasing interest in this, and as we'll see, a big focus of this has been on uh, carbon credits. We will talk about today then, in general, what is going on with carbon credits? What are they? How do you measure them? How do you sell them? What are climate smart agricultural commodities? And as we'll see, they are a way that we can capitalize on carbon credits. Then we'll talk about the specificities of soybean. How do soybeans figure into climate smart ag commodities and carbon credits? Is it any different from corn, et cetera? And finally, we'll end with some opinions that I have to help producers, CCAs, et cetera, navigate these carbon commodities or climate smart commodity chains. If there's one takeaway from today, it's that this is an emerging market and field of study slash policy. We've seen a lot happen in less than four years, and I think we'll see a lot happen in another four years for better or for worse. So with that, uh, I want to uh, thank the team members who made this possible, as well as the uh, farmers who are paying these checkoff funds and ISA as well. Uh, the project that is funding this webinar is shown here, benchmarking and integrating soil health, water quality, and climate smart footprints of Illinois soybean. It's a five-year project. We're now uh, just wrapping up the first year, the first season. There's four cropping seasons. And these are the team members, uh, most notably um, Heidi. She's the PhD student leading what you'll see now, the very grueling field work, what it takes to get accurate carbon credits. So the goal of this project overall is to understand how these three major outcomes along with uh, soybean yields are integrated. So for example, are there trade-offs? Is there antagonism between a soil health outcome and one of climate? Maybe there is, maybe there's a synergy. And we're trying to identify trade-offs and synergies among these outcomes. So to put this more conceptually, we're centered around the uh, productivity of cropping systems focused on soybean and different kinds of rotations. There's two major types that we are looking at. One is the typical corn soybean phase, sorry, a crop rotation. And the other is a corn and then double cropped wheat soybean. So we're looking at two rotation types 
and then looking at every single phase in every year at every site. So we have comprehensive understanding of soybeans role in these rotations. Our outcomes are as follows, as you can see here. And today I want to focus on the carbon credit outcome, also known as, or rather the basis for a climate smart commodity. So let's talk a bit about carbon credits and how these relate or not to climate smart agriculture. So let's talk about climate or carbon assessments and soybean. There are four guiding questions for this webinar that I want to walk you through. First is, how did we get here? How are we even talking about carbon credits or why are we talking about carbon credits in the first place? Second is, let's lay out some definitions on climate smart agriculture. And is that different from climate smart agricultural commodities? And spoiler, they're related, as you might think. Third, how do soybeans fit into CSA, both the practices and the commodities? Finally, some considerations for producers that I think that they should keep in mind. Let's begin with the first part. So how do we get here? Well, uh, if you've uh, not been under a rock, you probably have noticed a lot of talk about carbon markets, carbon commodities. And this is well evidenced by increasing private, so investment in uh, private sector companies, as well as public, largely federal, investment in the topic of carbon credits and now climate smart agriculture. So we've seen that the ecosystem service markets and carbon credits are one of these services increase in value for carbon credits specifically by a factor of six. So six times more dollar value and what's swirling around in these ecosystem service markets where there's uh, people buying or selling carbon credits in just the past three years. This is now outdated, though it's the best data that we have on this. So that's a fairly high rate of growth, 600% rate of growth in three years. We also, now this is a total value of uh, what is thought to be as of 2022 of $2 billion in private sector. Uh, this is all reviewed in this piece that was put up by the ecosystem marketplace, sort of an advocacy group or rather a, a clearinghouse that puts together all these kinds of carbon markets. And then on the public side, Perhaps the best example of increasing interest and investment would be the USDA Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities, PCSZ. Uh, this is a, a federal grant opportunity that was enrolled uh, back in 2022. And there was originally $1 billion, then it became $3 billion with the B dollar investment. So together, we're talking north of $5 billion uh, private to public in just the past five years or less. Let's focus a bit on the USD Partnerships Program. So this is a timeline of how it went down. Um, again, the RFP, meaning the request for proposals, were a funder, in this case, USDA says, hey, if folks have interest in grant money, uh, this is what we are looking for. That was dropped uh, in 2022. And then the last year timeline is shown here, the progress of these. So some key things to consider. Uh, this was a grant opportunity where USDA specifically was seeking private public partnerships. So land grants working with companies to make things happen on the ground. So there was two goals. One was to feel out, really to explore what are uh, different public, uh, sorry, different private to public partnerships thinking about what could a carbon smart or let's say a climate smart carbon commodities program look like. There are different ways to do this. Inset or offset models, as we'll talk about, uh, how did we verify, report, and monitor. They're all different in how they could be done, and there's no right answer always. So the first was, I think, exploratory. What is out there? Second, apart from this brainstorm goal, would be getting practices on acres. So this original budget that was proposed by USDA was $1 billion. And given the outpouring of applications and the quality of those applications, the feds increased the budget by a factor of three to $3 billion. And again, scale was a prominent characterization of this. So to put it so to put this differently, this was not about funding basic research in a laboratory. This is about uh, getting almost an applied research project going that would have impact at scale. So having companies figure out with public scientists, how do we get farmers to do practices that make sense for them, profitably speaking, that are that are climate smart. 
So in all, there is about 25 million acres estimated to be uh, part of this. That's about 10% of all U.S. cropland, uh, 60,000 farms involved. And these are all across the U.S. So from the Corn Belt, where we find ourselves, to, say, horticulture in California, to apple orchards in the uh, Northwest. So second point, what is climate smart agriculture? or CSA. I want to lay out some broad terms and specifically talk about the, the distinction between climate smart agriculture, which is a way of farming, and this can be for forestry, for vegetables, for crops, for livestock, and then the commodities that would result from that practice. And this then is how they are related. A commodity that's climate smart results from a climate smart ag practice or set of practices. So broadly defined by USDA, climate smart agriculture is uh, livestock, forestry, or crop production that involves practices that either help us adapt to climate change. So, for example, no tillage and cover cropping to reduce the, the erosional effects of increasing rainfall intensity. That's an example of adapting to climate change and also to mitigate climate change. So can we reduce climate forcing? Simply a way of saying, can we slow down the global mean temperature increase? which itself isn't always a problem. It's the unpredictability of local weather because of a global temperature increase. That seems to be the challenge. So for example, one year we get a very wet spring and the next year we get a bone dry summer, which we have seen in Illinois for the past three years. That's the risk of climate change that we're trying to mitigate and or adapt to with these practices. A lot of this work was originally in the tropics, in places like East Africa, Indonesia, where a lot of NGOs were thinking about climate smart ag to help buffer tropical farming systems from climate change, given projections that these impacts will be greatest in that part of the globe. And now it's being talked about in a temperate setting, so North America. So these are very broadly defined practices. Um, and then these practices in theory would result in a climate smart ag commodity. In a commodity, there's no difference here in how we're using the term from the typical business term. It's an entity, it's a thing that can be bought and sold. So this could be, for example, grain. It could be specifically soybean grain. It could be products that are value added from the raw material of soybean grain. So biodiesel, uh, cooking oil. Uh, feed for livestock. These are all examples of soybean as an agricultural commodity. And if it's grown in certain ways, it can now qualify as a climate smart ag commodity. You may have the question, who is saying soybean might qualify as, an, as a climate smart ag commodity, depending on the practice? Well, as we'll see, that depends on the program that one enrolls their crops and their bushels of soybean into. And if there's a takeaway here, it's that there's no standardized single authority or approach on that. Makes it exciting, but also there's some caution to be taken, I think. Now, the motivation for the commodities is unique to the temperate zone, I think, not the origins of the tropics. And that is a lot of private sector companies want to be able to decarbonize their value chain. Meaning a, a company, um, say like Walmart, wants to decrease the carbon footprint of some of their products. They want to understand where along the chain. So from packaging, going back to the sourcing, going back to the actual production, growing soybeans, for example. What are ways that we can decrease the net climate forcing effect? And that's why we're talking about carbon credits in the same discussion as climate smart ag commodities. The credits are a metric quantified that can be the basis for a climate smart ag commodity. Now, if we look at the history of these terms, the colors of this figure match the terms. So blue is climate smart ag. This is a Google search history. The data is available as far back as 2004. This is the last 20 years of Google search terms. We can see quite a bit of climate smart agriculture search terms in the early 2000s because of a lot of uh, international climate agreements being discussed and negotiated on a global scale among countries. And note the pretty flat line of climate smart ag commodities. That's because the magnitude of the climate smart ag searches outstrips this small increase that you can't really see here in the last five years for CSA commodities. So the point here is that climate smart ag has been a thing for a long time. Again, it began in the tropics as part of ag development programs. 
And it's seen a steady increase, not just these peaks in the 2000s due to UN conferences. This is showing the crescendo of interest. But the commodity part is fairly new. I want to talk through some terms to help you navigate and understand climate smart ag slash climate smart ag commodities. The first is the inset versus offset discussion. ISA has a great carbon guide on their website that I, that I would highly recommend, and they go into more detail on this. To summarize it here, inset and offsets are two ways to think about carbon crediting. So insets, the idea is that we increase the, the market value of a product for a practice in the production chain. So when it comes to insets for carbon credits, all this really means is that a company's product is produced in a way from the grower at the field to the final package for the consumer. It is produced in a way that has a lower carbon footprint. That can mean more carbon was sequestered in its production or there was less greenhouse gas emissions in its production. But the idea is that the literal product in that company's uh, offerings is lower carbon footprint. So um, this is valuable because it allows it is a uh, mechanism, I'll say, that allows companies downstream to compensate for their emissions. And uh, this also can be more strictly enforced. So, for example, a company, and this is happening now with some grain buyers overseas, they may stipulate they want to source soybeans that are grown with a verified carbon credit. So either that means using no tillage or a cover crop or both. They want some assurance that their soybeans have, you know, X uh, tons of carbon emitted per metric ton of soybean grain, something al uh, along those lines. That would be an example of an inset. Now, more common would be offsets. Offsets are where companies are decreasing their carbon footprint indirectly. They're paying someone to offset carbon in their own system. And by paying for it, they get to claim it for their net impact. So that's what an offset is. It's outside of the company's direct product value chain. Now, this can also make a real impact because there's a lot of dollars that are uh, available and there's more plasticity. So you may not be, um, say, sourcing soybeans for your product chain as a company, but uh, you can pay the grower that's outside of your direct value chain an offset payment. Or you get companies like Google or Microsoft that have nothing to do with direct ag value chains who want to put money into paying farmers to decrease the production of the soybean crop. And then Google can claim that they've offset their emissions by paying someone to lower that person's emissions. So offsets are more of a, a marketplace approach where you're trading credits. And this is where it can get a bit squirrely. It can get weird for a few reasons. One is that, well, first of all, we can't see or touch uh, carbon credits. They're not tractable. And so people have, I think, understandably, some healthy skepticism here. What are we actually selling? And it seems like we're selling air, and we kind of are, because CO2 is air. Um, and there's also, I think, a second reason why this gets weird to some people, and rightfully so, is that we need to trust that these offsets are based on credible numbers, that they're actually based on real reductions. Now, a separate concept here is MRV, Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification, which is simply interrelated but technically independent aspects of any inset or offset program, meaning you want to measure or to monitor some way of quantifying directly or by modeling what is the carbon credit. Have we increased soil carbon or have we decreased emissions or both? And that would be a carbon credit. Second is reporting. How do you actually communicate this? How do you uh, how does the data flow from the field to the company? And then how is that then communicated to the public or to buyers? And verification is basically QCQA. It is quality control. So we have sort of like inspections. Do we actually have confidence? So verification ensures that the M, the measurement or the monitoring has credibility. And that's oftentimes done by a third party by a third party audit, just like organic certification. It's not the USC that does it, it is like the Oregon organic till, for example. They're the ones that have to come in and say, yes, there's high confidence or no, there's low confidence. So insets and offsets that are then supported by MRV. These are critical terms that you'll see floating around in these discussions on carbon credits. 
Now, most of our discussions in the past three or four years, especially from private sector, are focused on offsets. And the whole idea, again, is that there is a company that's willing to buy a, a carbon credit. Uh, they will give dollars to the sector, to the individuals or groups that can decrease carbon footprints. And again, two ways to do that, and they can both happen, is that you decrease the emissions from soil of greenhouse gases. CO2 is a prominent one, followed by N2O, and, and or you increase carbon in the soil. They both had the same net effect of decreasing atmospheric CO2 or CO2 equivalency. So N2O is equivalent to 298 times of CO2. So one pound of N2O is worth 300 pounds of CO2. That's why we say equivalency, it's not just CO2. But the whole concept here of offsets is that a company not producing soybeans wants to pay a soybean farmer to reduce their soybean carbon footprint. I have a question here in the chat box. How do countries like China and India work into the carbon markets? It's a good question. That would depend on the market. Is this market international? Is it domestic? But in theory, especially for offsets, uh, you could see companies like, say, Google that might be buying carbon offsets from, say, Chinese or Indian uh, cropping systems or, say, forestry systems. That would be an example. But I think that you're raising a good point here, which is, uh, is there any global marketplace? The answer is there's not a clear leader in that currently. Okay. So let's talk about how do we measure carbon credits? This is part of the M of the measurement, as well as the V of the verification, or it can be for the verification process. And I wanna walk you through this because I wanna show you the sausage gets made. It's a little messy when you see pork sausage being produced um, and that metaphor is apt here because there are uncertainties and this is key to navigate carbon credit, marketplaces, programs, et cetera. So there's two components to a carbon credit, as I've said, again, the carbon stock of the production system. More carbon in the soil means more has been taken out from the atmosphere. And so we need to measure bulk density and carbon concentrations. And if you multiply these two, then you get the carbon stock. So how many tons of carbon to a depth in the soil is their carbon stock? Typically, this means sampling deep. Surface sampling is not going to cut it for high confidence monitoring and verification. And this therefore involves deep sampling with carbon stock assessments with bulk density. Uh, variability here in soil carbon stocks can be a challenge. So this is an example of a field in Douglas County um, in Illinois, uh, just south of Champaign, about 50 minutes. And basically the carbon stock in the top uh, half meter can vary quite a bit. We've got some hot spots. These are the wet depressional spots, the prairie potholes because they're so wet, hold on to a lot more carbon or can better store it than the better drained parts of the field. And that's why we see within the span of about, this is, I believe, a 54 acre chunk. In these 54 acres, we did a half acre grid sampling. We see tremendous variability in carbon stocks. So this is an important consideration is how you design sampling that is cost effective and highly accurate. And by accurate, I mean, we get the right number. Not the same as precision, which is the spread of our value. So we want accuracy and precision. And also for it to be cheap, uh, this is where you start to have to decide trade-offs. So do you want accuracy or do you want cheapness? And sometimes they are opposed to each other. More on that in just a second. So the first component of, of a carbon credit is the carbon stock, specifically the increase or really the change in the carbon stock. Credits mean that there's a net positive. So we see an increase in carbon stocks. The other would be a decrease in greenhouse gases. And there's four major greenhouse gases. And in our uh, non-rice production systems of the Corn Belt, we care about CO2 and about N2O. N2O is a small amount. We're talking one to five pounds of N as N2O per acre. So we're putting on 180 pounds of N per acre for corn. One to five pounds of N as N2O is really not much. So agronomically, we don't really care about N2O. And I'll stand by that. Now, for climate footprints, we absolutely care about N2O because uh, five pounds of N2O is 1,500 pounds of carbon equivalent. And that is easily three times more carbon equivalency than a carbon, sorry, than a cover crop could ever achieve in one year. So N2O 
despite the small magnitude of pounds per acre of N emitted, is incredibly important for the net climate effect of cropping systems. In fact, it is the greatest uncertainty component in our carbon footprint assessments in the Corn Belt as N2O. So carbon dioxide speaks for itself. Methane can also matter. We think of this as livestock typically, but it is part of these wet spots, especially. It's big from wetlands, but also from wet spots and fields. And then uh, it's very important in flooded soils that are used for crop production like rice. But again, for the Corn Belt, that's not really an issue for us. Ammonia could also be on uh, NH3, but we're not uh, including it here. So measurements, uh, soil carbon stocks change very slowly. This is itself a challenge. We might need four to five years to see a change in a practice to manifest a, a change in carbon stocks. Really, I think we're looking at five to 10 years, depending on the sampling resolution. Greenhouse gases, though, we, we have to be measuring at minimum weekly and more like two to three times a week if we have what's called an event. An event can be tillage, it can be fertilizing, uh, it can be adding manure, it can be a rainfall event. These are events that tend to spike greenhouse gas emissions. The soils are belching more gases. And so, as you might imagine, that's a lot of work for field assessments. I'll, and so here's an example of, of what this takes. This is one of our research technicians, Natasha. She's shown here with our portable greenhouse gas analyzer. This is one of two major methods. The other would be out of the field where we take the gas sample back. We use this method for the ISC project because we are measuring at least once a week at 200 research plots across three sites in uh, in the state, greenhouse gas emissions. So to, so to hit 200 plots every week across Illinois, it takes a lot of work, a lot of road time uh, to get good measurements. So because of that, we use a portable approach. Each unit, we have five of them, is, is uh, costs us 65 grand. So there's a pretty large material cost. We're talking half a million bucks roughly for maintenance as well to keep this program going. And if you look closely at what we're doing here, we have what looks like PVC. And you're correct, that is uh, PVC. We capped the PVC uh, with a top. And in this top, this a chamber, we've now enclosed the system. If we have gases being emitted from the soil, which we always do, it's always a question of how much, these gases can't just diffuse out because now they're, they're being contained. So we're measuring the rate of gas concentration changing. Over time, the gases begin to accumulate and we can measure that concentration change with this gas met unit. So we're measuring the rate of emissions, how much CO2 and NCO is being belched from the soil. So there's the chamber, it's fixed. This stays in the field all year. We pull it out for a tillage pass if there's a tillage uh, plot. Then we put on the collar, the gases build up inside. We then, the gases have a filter that, that they flow through to take out moisture, which can interfere with the uh, quantification. The gases then flow into the gas met, where they're then quantified using infrared technology. Uh, and then the gases go back because we don't want to create a vacuum by pumping out the gases. So this is how we're doing the greenhouse gases for this ISA project. This is one of the two approaches. The other approach is that you simply take a needle and syringe and you, after 30 minutes, you take a gas sample through a septum at the top of that collar. And then it goes back to lab for quantification. We do both approaches for the ISA work, again, because of the scale we're doing the this current one. So what we're really quantifying then is these gases, as they percolate up through the soil pore network, once we cap the soil with this uh with this uh, collar, we can then see the increase in CO2 concentrations. The same would go for N2O. And we can see over time, even at the second scale, the part per million concentration is increasing steadily for this example of CO2. To put it differently, we're quantifying rates. So we know for every minute, how many micrograms of CO2 per square plot, or sorry, per square meter. We can do some math and say per day, per week, how many pounds of carbon per acre are being emitted? Note we're making some big assumptions. We're assuming from a little area over a few minutes what the tons per acre per year emissions are. And that's the reality of how we get carbon credits from the greenhouse component of, sorry, the, the greenhouse gas component of the credit. Okay, so 
this is a, this is quite a bit of work. And you might be asking, well, can we just model it? Do we have to go to every field for the V and the M of the VRN? Can we just model it if we've got good field data, if we can calibrate a model? The answer is, of course, you can model it. You can model anything, but garbage in is garbage out. In the case of carbon credits, the data is hard to get. And so a key thing to consider is that there is a carbon credit program that you are evaluating for enrollment. Consider how they're uh, how they are informing their models. Do they do a validation? And if they do, and they should be, what kind of data is being collected at the field scale? This is an example of all the different components in the system that one would need to model. This is a paper uh, led by my colleague, Dr. Guan at U of I, uh, showing what's called the ecosystem model that his lab uses. There's many different components, as you can see. These are all different components that have to be modeled to have a high confidence. And that means a lot of things have to be measured, like CO2 emissions, uh, the export of grain from the system, all the factors in the soil that can influence the crop growth, et cetera. So these models, uh, yes, is the short answer, but it depends on the quality of the model. And if we think about all these different ways to monitor or measure and then to verify, we have a, the typical trade-offs of cost and accuracy. So what we want ideally is to be in the top right quadrant, right? We want high accuracy, uh, excuse me, uh, this is a mistake. We want high accuracy, but we want low cost. So we don't want that, we wanna be here. The circle refers to where we typically find ourselves. Typically high accuracy also begets a high cost. So the circle is where we typically are, where we wanna be is to move down toward this two dimensional space we want to be, I misspoke again, folks, I'm sorry, we want to be high accuracy and low cost. So we want to move down into this part of the space. This is the preferred, as we can see here, uh, because we would want to have accurate assessments that aren't going to break the bank. So if, if we look at what's involved here, um, we've got the high cost and high accuracy of our typical approaches, which is what we're doing for research, which is on the ground, boots on the ground, quantification, sampling every year for carbon stocks, for uh, greenhouse gases would be almost weekly or intermittent soil sampling for carbon stock changes. And preferred would be, well, we have high accuracy that would be bestowed by this kind of sampling, but this sample could then for models like a systems model that Dr. Guan does to get into the space, two, two dimensionally speaking of a lower cost and still preserving the accuracy. We don't wanna be up here, right? This is a fail because that means we have low accuracy and high cost. No one wants that. And I would think of this, and you might wonder, is anyone in that space? Um, yeah, you would think of very badly built models that some companies offer. That to me would be high cost to build that model and low accuracy. More common though is this for models. We see low cost because models tend to be cheaper and we got low accuracy. So. Uh, the quadrants that are most common are going to be the top right and the bottom left. These are most common, but what we where we want to go would be this bottom right quadrant, and we want to stay away from that. Okay. So let's get on to our second topic, which is, well, this is an ISA webinar. How do soybeans fit into Climate Smart Ag? And I've been giving you examples of how this might look like for a soybean system or a soybean farmer, but let's talk about brass tacks what, if anything, is specific to soybean, to the soybean phase of corn soybean or corn double cropped wheat soybean systems and specifically in Illinois? So let's think about the challenges that soybean phases face. The key one is that there's just less biomass left behind after we take off soybean grain compared to corn. There's a lot more residues left behind when it comes to corn versus soybean. And we're talking about based on 2023 statewide yields for Illinois, if we use these yields, we can estimate this much in terms of tons of residue per acre. So uh, it's about two X more residues for corn than soybean. Uh, that can make a difference because these residues are organic matter, right? The stalk, the leaves, and they're roughly half by mass carbon. So more carbon being added to soils tends to favor more carbon stabilized as soil organic matter. We want more of that for the carbon credit. So this is a challenge. 
there's an indirect effect of having less carbon added to soils after soybean harvest. And that would be that the lower carbon input can favor the loss of nitrogen, or specifically it can mineralize from organic matter into nitrate. And that nitrate, if it's not used by a crop and it's not leached, can be lost as N2O. Our N2O losses, meaning the emissions, are due to surplus inorganic nitrogen, meaning nitrate is building up in soil. And if it's not leached by rainfall, it is susceptible to being denitrified, so undoing D of the nitrate, meaning we're producing N2O. Now let's talk about where soybeans can turn this around. Um, soybeans can take practices that are thought to be climate smart ag practices. And climate smart ag practices here are covered cropping and no tillage with both benefits of climate smart ag. So they can both be, be used to adapt and to mitigate. Of course, for carbon credits, we care about the latter. We think about a practice that's climate smart as a way to mitigate climate change, meaning reducing its carbon footprint. So cover cropping and no tillage both tend to favor carbon increases in soil, and they can sometimes decrease greenhouse gas emissions. And that one is contentious, as I'll show you shortly. Now, there's, as we all know, lower yield drag risk when we have cover crops in front of soybean compared to corn, and same goes for no tillage. So soybean is uniquely positioned to favor carbon credits via the mechanism of carbon increases in soil. Again, cover cropping and conservation tillage of some type. Now, the other reason why we think soybeans may have a leg up compared to the corn phase for introducing uh, more of a carbon credit would be that there's no end fertilizer being added. And this generally favors a lower end surplus, meaning less nitrate in the soil and thus lower end to emissions. But I'm saying generally because in some cases, soybeans can admit, sorry, can emit an appreciable amount of, of N2O. And roughly speaking, one third of the N2O of a corn soybean crop rotation is from the soybean phase, despite no end fertilizer. So we should not commit the fallacy of saying, well, there's no end going on to soybeans. N2O emissions are nil for soybean. That is not true. They're a third of the rotation with corn. So let's talk about tillage and cover cropping and how and how it relates to carbon uh, emissions, as CO2 as well as N2O um, in soybeans specifically. So uh, we know that tillage uh, is overall good for soil carbon. I won't talk about this. The evidence is that tillage is not a huge, sorry, that no tillage does not favor a huge increase over tillage in soils. The evidence is mixed, but basically there tends to be more carbon in the surface under no-till and tillage, it, it just tends to be more evenly across the soil profile. There's a small positive effect of no tillage on average compared to tillage. So it's still a good thing for the carbon credit. What about CO2 emissions, though? And so what we see here is that CO2 emissions um, in general tend to be increased by tillage events, whether we're doing chisel or disc or undercut. And if we use instead glyphosates, uh, to terminate the cover crop versus tillage to incorporate it, we see that there's a net savings in CO2 emitted. And that's what this graph on the right shows you. We can see that if we're using burn down to kill the cover crop and we're not killing it by tillage with some kind of incorporation, as shown here, we see lower CO2. Note that there's not a huge difference between the CO2 emissions. These are tons per hectare. So divide by two to get into tons per acre. Uh, there's still quite a bit of CO2 coming off the field, no matter what you do, right? That would be the baseline here. We just get less shown here. This is the savings by doing no tillage with, with just the burn down to kill it. If we burn down and then we till, or we just terminate by tilling, which I know is not that common given the biomass amounts of, uh, of a cover crop, then we see more CO2 being put out. So the point here is that tillage does provide a carbon credit, but it's not a huge one, right? We're not decreasing CO2 by a factor of twofold or threefold. Still, it can add up over time. Now, we know that in Illinois, overall, uh, a lot of soybean is produced with no tillage, as the survey from uh, 2019 found over the last four years at the time, roughly almost half of soybean production in the state was under no tillage, meaning that we're just not tilling much after the corn crop. That doesn't mean that we're not tilling going into the corn crop. And so, uh, and then if, if we think 
two or less passes. Together, we're talking on the order of roughly 70% of soybean is some kind of conservation tillage. I know these definitions are contentious. Now, this is important because a lot of these uh, practices have been in place well before 2015, really because of the uh, the adoption of, of conservation tillage as part of HEL regulations. Uh, we saw a large scale adoption of Conservation Act defined as no till strip or lower passes, depending on the definition for the region. The point here is that there's what's called the additionality problem, meaning if you've already been doing a climate smart ag practice, can you get the carbon credit for the thing that you were already doing? And, and a lot of programs uh, don't permit you to count a practice that you were already doing. This is an issue because it might incentivize perversely people to go out of 20 years of no-tillage, rip up their no-till systems, and then after five years of chisel tilling, go back into no-till. So that doesn't really do what we want, which is having a net benefit to climate forcing. But that would be a logical conclusion of markets that do not permit additionality. Now, let's talk about cover cropping, and I'm going to include uh, double cropping here with the wheat crop because the wheat crop is effectively like a cover crop insofar as soil benefits that you can harvest and increase profitability. Uh, so they're here together, and you might even be able to merge these, right? One could still double crop wheat soybeans and then also put in a cover crop, even interseed it. That would be the most eco groovy approach here. But even in, in this example shown here, we've got full coverage of the soil, which matters for soil health and erosion. But for the carbon question, this is great because, again, there's now more carbon entering the soil system that can increase carbon stocks and thus increase the carbon credit. Now, let's talk about um, what that increase can be. This is a study led by Kai Yiguan's group again. Uh, our lab gave some data at the Morrow plot shown here. And we have multiple sites across the state of Illinois. And what we found that overall, there is a small increase on average across these sites. We're talking on the order of about, uh, let's say point, so from 0.3 to 0.5, about 0.2 tons of carbon per hectare. That's gonna be about 0.1 ton of carbon per acre, right? Hectares, 2.2 acres. So that's not huge, but it's not nothing. Just like tillage, these are small increases in carbon stock. These are realistic estimates. If you're seeing companies offering carbon credits based on a practice like carbon cropping that they think is going to give you one, one ton per acre per year, I would be very skeptical. We're seeing that typically we're talking about very small increases on the order not of one ton, as this line might show, we're talking fractions of a ton per acre per year. And that's what the science suggests around the world. What about greenhouse gas emissions, specifically N2O emissions, if we have uh, covered crops or soybean? Let's first talk about soybean. So we care about N2O emissions from soybean, even though they're, they're not getting N fertilizer because well, soybeans uh, might favor net nitrate accumulation because they're not adding a whole lot of carbon. And there's a recent assessment, recent, it's now nine years old. There's a model used by Department of Energy and all of these discussions on carbon credits called GREET, shown here. And they updated the model recently to say that soybeans are responsible in the corn-soybean rotation for one-third of N2O. This is an estimate model. Some evidence from Iowa State suggests it might be more like 40%, not 36%. So it's similar, but it might be higher. This means soybeans have a greater role through things like cover cropping, earlier planting. We're talking early April now um, to be able to soak up the residual nitrate that is responsible for the N2O. So again, soybeans can uniquely contribute to decreasing this N2O from their contributions of the two-year crop rotation. Now, let's think about cover crops, not just the soybean, but cover crops, whether they're in front of soybeans or corn. Um, cover crops have mixed impacts on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, both total CO2 equivalency and N2O specifically. And basically, in some cases, cover crops increase greenhouse gases. In some cases, they decrease. It depends on soil properties, on the cover crop species, the weather, all these things. Let's focus on the study on the right hand by Dr. Bosch at UNH. She had a very nice meta-analysis. Uh, back in 2019. And what she found was the following. What you have here is called a response ratio. So basically, 
if we see that the number is above zero, sorry, if it's below zero, then on average, all of these studies, the number of studies is shown here on the right hand side. If the, if the number is less than zero towards the negative, it means that we saw less N2O from the practice. The practice would be here. So are we incorporating by tilling the cover crop? Yes or no. Uh, and what kind of cover crop? Is it a biculture cover crop? So a species mixture? Is it a legume or is it a non-legume? And so if for less uh, than zero, if we're decreasing N2O. And if we are above zero, then we are increasing N2O. So what we find here is first, N2O emissions go up with the cover crop in two occasions. If we till it in, we increase the N2O compared to not cover cropping. And this makes sense because we're effectively now adding a tillage effect and tillage increases N2O. Second, if the cover crop is a legume species like hairy vetch, um, then that's going to also increase N2O. And that's a pretty strong size effect. We are, this is a log ratio, but this is a significant increase in N2O emissions from these two practices, and they're similar. These are likely to be additive, right? If you tillage, sorry, if you till in a legume covered crop, it might be even more. That wasn't tested in this study, however. So there's a slight increase from a cereal species or a, let's say, non leguminous covered crop, but it's pretty minor. It's almost close to zero. So what this means then is that there are some guidance here on what cover crops are better and how we manage them for carbon credits. Don't till it in, just do a burn down and stick to a non-legume if the focus is a carbon credit. Again, a leguminous one might be beneficial for uh, cutting down on N inputs on soil health processes. These are the trade-offs that we're trying to quantify currently. Now let's give an example of greenhouse gases from our ISA project. Uh, this is the project shown here on the bottom, a screenshot. We are developing field-based quantifications, hard data that can then inform models and provide ISA and soybean producers in the state some guidance. We call this benchmarking because there's no data out there. There's no comprehensive assessment of across major regions of, of the states, uh, specifically under different practices, and then by the phases of multiple rotation types. This is basic data. We'll have a good assessment in four years. Um, so here's what we're doing. We took the soil samples to three foot depth. We can see differences by soil types, southern and northern, quite clear. The timber soils from the south, prairie soils from central and north. And again, we've got greenhouse gas assessments at minimum every single week until the ground freezes hard. I'm going to show you the greenhouse gas data. The soil carbon data will be done at the end of the four-year trials because, again, carbon changes at very slow, meaning at least two to four-year time scales. So here is the data on the greenhouse gases from the first full season. So from harvest of the preceding crop last November, well, before this last season, I should say, and then ending with the harvest of the soybeans this October, more or less. So it's a one-year assessment led by Haiti Allen with the support of the team that you saw on the second slide. Before I show you any of the emission data, I'm going to walk you through how to read this. So there's a lot going on here because it's a large project. We've got our three sites, Ewing in the south and in Franklin County, Monmouth in the northwest, and Urbana in central states. So we've got alpha sol, timber soils, and then the two molecules. And we've got the gases here by color code. So we've got CO2, we've got N2O, and then we've got methane. And note that the units are CO2 equivalency because now we can compare apples to apples. Equivalency means that we've got roughly speaking uh, 300 CO2 units from one unit of, from one unit of N2O and roughly about 100 from, or excuse me, about 90 from the methane. So we are weighing the absolute amount of CO2, N2O, and CH4 by their equivalency to come up with a total how many kilos of carbon per hectare from the gas side of the carbon credit. And note these are pretty big numbers, right? So this is going to be uh, 8 metric tons, 12, and 16. Okay. Now, the final thing to note, sorry, there's two more things. The treatments are on the very bottom. At every single site, we have an, a full design of a covered crop with or without tillage, and then we've got no cover crop with or without tillage. So we can compare these to understand, for example, the effect of tilling without the cover crop would be comparing these two. The effect of the cover crop under tillage would be uh, comparing these two, right? They're both till, but with and without the cover and so on and so forth.
And finally, we've got the crop rotations and phases. So phases on top, meaning that in this season of 2023, what we just ended, we measured these emissions in the corn in a conventional corn soybean versus a corn wheat soybean double crop. And then likewise, this is the soybean phase in the corn soybean rotation versus in the wheat soybean double crop. And we counted the wheat emissions in this one because wheat soybean is being seen as a system here. Okay, that is how to navigate this panel. Let's walk through one by one the different treatments and locations. So we'll begin down south and go up north, increasing uh, or uh, sorry, increasing soil organic matters as we go from Ewing to Urbana to Monmouth, but also colder temperatures, thus lower gases expected. So the letters here connote significance. If, if uh, two treatments have the same letter, they're not any different, meaning that uh, this one is not different from these at all or from any of these. However, we see that there is a difference between uh, cover with no till right here with no cover with tillage. These are opposite treatments, right? So we've got cover cropping with no tillage. That is the best practice from a soil health and climate smart ag practice perspective. And as expected, the lowest total emissions. And if we've got no cover with tillage, that's the opposite. That would be what you would expect to most increase the greenhouse gases. So these two extremes are different from each other by a pretty good chunk, right? We're talking about 30% more CO2 emissions. So uh, that's a decent carbon credit gotten by dual practices of carbon cropping and no tillage. But these are not different from the other two uh, treatment combinations. At the other sites and phases, sorry, at the other phases and rotations, there's no difference statistically speaking. This is not unusual. These are very nuanced effects. If we go up north to central state at Urbana, this is now a molosol, more, uh, or, so there's more SOM, there's more uh, fertility. We can sometimes see more emissions because of that. We actually see lower overall. So lower net emissions, we're talking less than 5,000 CO2 kilos per hectare, so less than five tons per uh, hectare on average. We're looking uh, almost double that, or at least half more than that down south. So there are soil type region, spe uh, region specific effects. Keep in mind, it's a lot warmer at Ewing in the summers typically than in central state. That might be part of it. Also warmer spring times. Here we see that uh, now it's in the soybean phase that we see a difference uh, between the treatments and the two extremes of the most CSA and the non-CSA combinations don't differ. Now we get treatment differences if we say no cover and no till. So just no tillage has much lower compared to cover cropping with tillage. So it seems like in this in this one site for the soybean phase, there's a greater carbon credit in this one year by just doing no tillage. And we see that there's as a result of that more emissions with the cover crop. But again, that's mixing with tillage. You can see how this is a bit complicated, right? Final one is up at Monmouth. There, there is no double crop system. So we're not double cropping wheat and soybeans that, that far north, hence why these two boxes are white. But we just have one rotation. We've got here the corn phase and the soybean phase. Note that we have as high, if not slightly higher emissions under the soybean phase and under the corn phase at Monmouth this past season. That's interesting, right? Again, soybeans can emit an appreciable amount. And this is being driven by CO2, which is in the blue more than by the N2O, which is in the green. Alrighty, so I know I'm getting tight on time here. The point here is that here now we see what we would expect, what we saw at Ewing, where the extremes of no cover and tillage um, seem to have, uh, excuse me, uh, I just mixed that up. So cover and no-till has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions, that, that, that's what we want. And the business as usual of tillage and no cover has the highest as expected. And then we find that in the corn phase, it seems like covers are increasing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an example of how cover crops did a net negative for the greenhouse gas component of the carbon credit. If we compare uh, tillage, which is this one, and tillage here with a cover crop and without the cover crop, we see that there is an increase in emissions. This is an example of the trade-offs that we're trying to quantify in this ISA work. All right. Final thing that I'll end on is considerations for farmers in Illinois, soybean producers specifically, when navigating these uh, carbon markets, carbon credits, or CSA markets, all the same thing. 
So first, and this is, I think, the takeaway, these this is all a wild west. There's not yet a standardized approach and there's no single authority. Uh, there needs to be, I think, a single force, maybe public, maybe private, to organize all these markets. First thing is that there's no clear clearinghouse for easy program comparison. Think about Amazon. If you look at a product, uh, you can compare different features of a laptop, right? The the, the RAM, the, uh, the the speed, et cetera, and have a table to just go down the list. That is needed and not yet present for these uh, different markets. We would want to compare price. The terms of the contract are being locked in. Is there flexibility in practices? Is there a penalty for leaving? Um, are you eligible? What is needed to qualify? And then cost benefit. This goes back to might you lose money in the end because of a rigid contract for the carbon credit? Then how is the price per ton of carbon determined? Um, and then how does that compare to what the actual credit is? So is this price per practice or price per ton per carbon credit? Third consideration would be how are these results being reported in the program? Then how, how, are they, how are they being verified by a third party, if at all? This is important to understand the realistic nature of the market or of the specific program that you are enrolled in. Unrealistic programs may not survive another five years. They're probably going to be overestimating uh, these credits, and that's not good once the data comes in that these are overestimations. How will VRM be done, and what is your obligation as the producer? Is it going to saddle you with a lot of assessment or even just paperwork? Time is money. Uh, does, it pre does it prevent you from certain other programs that might make you more money or just different practices that might make sense in a dry or wet year that now you can't do because of the contract? So overall, I think program transparency is key when considering this. Programs that are not very transparent, in my opinion, are not very credible. Uh, think about compensation for pre-existing practices. If you've been no-till for 30 years, does that get credited or compensated in the contract or in the program? This is the issue of additionality that we've discussed. And finally, this has been uh, hinted at a few times, opportunity costs. Are you losing money down the road because of locking in right now into a, a lower price per carbon or just a rigid contract where you can't pivot in a hard year for a different practice. Now, there are some, some uh, comparison tools that are emerging, like this one shown here. They weigh different things like rigor, how long is the carbon there, safeguards. Note that the ratings are never more than, than three out of five checks. So if this was a Yelp review for a restaurant, I probably would not want to eat at these restaurants, so to speak, because none of them are cracking four stars or five stars. This, I think, speaks to the reality that this is a wild west. We're still trying to understand, meaning the companies, how to go about VRM for carbon credits. So in summary, um, what are climate smart ag commodities or just ag itself? Well, offsets or insets, it's a way to reduce climate footprints indirectly or directly. VRM is critical to this. How do soybeans fit into CSA, both the practices and the commodities? Well. Uh, despite having low carbon inputs because of the residues of soybean, soybeans allow for the CSA practices and thus the commodities, meaning the soybean grain, to be realized with, I think, more potential than corn. And there's also room to decrease N2O emissions for soybean in a way that might be more challenging for corn. And finally, considerations for soybean farmers in our states to navigate these markets, ask questions. Transparency is key. Be patient, not just with the company, but also might be good to sit on the sidelines to see whether the prices for carbon go up, whether there's going to be a public marketplace made by the feds to standardize the practice. These are all things that I think we will see whether or not they happen in the next four to five years. Uh, and think about how realistic is the program, whether it ties your hands for a short term benefit that might have a long term net negative ROI opportunity costs. And then, of course, these trade-offs are part of those opportunity costs. So with that, I want to thank the audience for their, for their time. I know we're right one minute left. Happy to take any questions now or by email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really great. A lot of awesome information there. And yeah, like you said, it is a very, very much a Wild West still. <laughs> so we appreciate this overview. Um, and yeah, since we're bumping right up against 11 o'clock, I would suggest that if you have questions, please go ahead and email Dr. Marganot. 
and we'll go ahead and wrap up today. So thank you again so much all for attending. If you are a certified crop advisor, go ahead and scan that QR code on your screen. Or if you would rather email our staff member, Connie Copley, please do that to request your CCA credit. Um, and Connie's email is in the chat. Please stay tuned to illsoyadvisor.com for the recording of this webinar and for updates on this research project and other ISA funded research. Uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.